From the uncharted territory of the 1600s to today's climate challenges, the Arctic remains a realm of exploration and resilience. I'm Danielle Parody, a reporter with APTN News, and this is The Place That Thaws. Across six episodes, my colleague Trevor Wright and I take you to northern communities in Canada to experience life in the warming Arctic. We decided to speak to the locals ourselves and find out about the sorts of changes they've noticed in the weather, the landscape, and how it's affecting them and their communities. And we explore how Bill Gates and Dan Aykroyd somehow come into this. Resolute Bay, none of it. In the high Arctic, Resolute Bay is at the eastern entrance of the Northwest Passage. It was named for the British ship HMS Resolute, abandoned in 1850 while searching for the passage and the lost Franklin expedition, a famed explorer whose ship got stuck in the ice. The hamlet shares its name with the Resolute desk that adorns the Oval Office, made from oak timbers from the exploration ship. You may know the High Arctic through this Stan Rogers song. I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea, tracing one warm line. Yeah, that one. When I talk to people about the trip I made, we inevitably talk about how far north we've been. For most of us here in the south, it's not this far. In Resolute Bay, there's a population of around 180 people, and 83% of the community is Inuit. It's the second most northern community in Canada and sits on the southern shore of Cornwallis Island, way, way up above the tree line. Hello, Trevor. Hi. On our first day in Resolute, my colleague Trevor and I talk about the weather. Trevor is APTN's Iqaluit reporter. So it's very windy. Um, it's not... It's not that cold. It's like minus five Celsius. So it's not really what I think of when I think of the Arctic. What about you? You live uh, in the Arctic all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you got to be careful when it gets real windy because like it says minus like 15 on the website, but then you go out and like the wind amplifies that. <laughs> Especially like, when there's nothing like block it, like no trees, no like city landscape or anything like that. The land is dark and full of gravel when not covered in snow. There's not a lot of topsoil, and the rock that juts out of the bay is limestone and sandy dolomite, a sort of gray or tan-colored rock. The hamlet has been in its current location since 1975. There are many species of wildlife around the Arctic Ocean. Polar bears, seals, and narwhal, to name a few. Ravens replace the seagulls you would find in the more southern communities. And when we were there, the Arctic Ocean was not yet frozen. I met Amy Saluvanik at the Hamlet office. She's the social coordinator and organizes Halloween parties, Christmas events, and other get-togethers. Like many people who live in Resolute Bay, Amy is young, 27, and she has children. Amy is worried about things like her kids' education, and as someone who plans activities for the hamlet, she wants to make sure that people are participating in their culture and learning their language. Amy probably thought it was weird that two out-of-towners were roaming around asking questions, but she was nice enough to answer ours. So the sense of community is changing? I feel like, yeah, most people don't want to come have fun, like, do any activities with any of the kids right now, I guess. Too busy with home stuff. 
Was it different when you were little? Yeah, people were out more and they would do activities. I noticed that the more they have devices, the more they're home. So even in Resolute Bay, people are just on their phone too much? Yeah. <laughs> it's, ev- it's literally everywhere. Yeah. Oh, I have one too. <laughs> As someone who has lived in Resolute the majority of her life, she's also worried about the changing weather patterns. What I noticed is that there's like less snow, more wind. Like there used to be so much mountains of snow and now it's not so much anymore. Even this time of year there'd be a lot of snow? Yeah. I remember one time there used to be it, there was so much snow that the doors and the trucks were covered. And now it's like... Yeah. I don't know, there's maybe like a foot before it got plowed? Yeah. You know, they plow the roads here better than Edmonton. Do they? <laughs> I'm serious. In Edmonton, there's giant windrows and you have to like... <laughs> stab over them to get anywhere. But it looks like they did a really good job. Moving it out but of the it's way. slippery, yeah. so it's scary. Right. Yeah. Like, the roads are so bad here now, now that most of the good operators resigned or retired. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that in the north, people just walk into people's homes. Is yeah. that true? Yeah. You just walk in? When, when people knock, we think it's the cops. <laughs> <laughs> Following the advice from Amy, Trevor and I walk into Mark Amarillic's house. Well, actually, I made Trevor do it. We don't have the exact moment on tape because in my deep discomfort about the idea, I forgot to press the record button. But things were fine. Mark agreed to meet us at the Hamlet office. That was my first time ever just walking into someone's house, just that I didn't know. We don't do that in Edmonton. Yeah, it's a little different when you come from down south and when you come up north. I leave my door open because we get polar bears yeah. in town, so if somebody needs to go in, my door is open. So. On the evening we arrived, a town election was held. Mark is now the outgoing mayor. He still has a lot on his plate as a hunter and a member of the local search and rescue team. Like all hunters, Mark is used to adapting to the circumstances out on the land. He notices the changes but seems to be somewhat relaxed about it. So uh, Cornwallis Island, uh, yeah, we're, we're there right So here. where are we? We're right here. There's this little black dot here just by the end of the Y. Mark is showing Trevor and I a map of Resolute and the area where the ice used to freeze. Well, when so, the ice freezes, this is Cornwallis Island right here where we live. Yeah. Resolute Bay is just on the southern central coast on Cornwall. Now, uh, when I said when the ice freezes over to the next side, then I talked about the island, oh, Somerset. Wow. Uh, when it fully freezes over, yeah. and sometimes we'll get flowage that goes along here yeah. like that. Uh, we are with this area up here, because there's a lot of current. At times you don't know if you're just going through snow. Uh, some areas we avoid around here, spring and almost all year round. That lots of current. Uh, this area we watch out almost all year round, even in the winter time. It's about 76 kilometers between Cornwallis Island, where we are now, and Somerset Island. Aerial photographs in the Hamlet office show a dramatic change in the landscape in a short period of time, showing a large temperature change for the area. In 1979, the mean temperature was minus 16.3 Celsius. Today, that average is 13.8. This never used to turn green before. Now it turns green. So this picture of Resolute Bay in 95, this was in the middle of summer? Yep. There's still snow. Yep. Now it's green. Yep, with snow. (laughs) 
After meeting Mark, we asked to speak to his father, Peter Amarillic, who was born in Resolute. Peter's parents were part of a group who called themselves the High Arctic Exiles. Unlike other Inuit communities further south, Resolute isn't a natural Inuit settlement. In 1953 and 55, a group of Inuit were persuaded by the Canadian government to leave their homes in northern Quebec with the promises of better hunting and new homes. The government told them if they didn't like their new home, they could leave if they wanted to. But like so many promises to Indigenous people, they reneged on their part of the deal. Now, a generation after the relocation, Peter hunts for the community to help with food security. Like his son, Peter is relaxed and easygoing. Uh, born in 61 in Resolute, over here. <laughs> Took a lot of reading and writing and do a little bit of arithmetic stuff up here. <laughs> reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yeah. The classic. The three R's. <laughs> um, I had a chance to go to school, to college, but... I couldn't take it down there, so I went back up here and... We walked to his truck so he can give us a tour of the community. So we're in your hands now, Peter. All right. <laughs> Where are we I'm going? Warm. I'm warming up. What time do you wake up normally? Uh, Around four-ish. <laughs> in the morning? In the morning. What do you do then? <laughs> Drive around, <laughs> bike, look. <laughs> this vehicle now that we got to use for now, we're doing more patrolling now, and it's warmer. <laughs> what do you look for when you're on patrol? Uh, we make sure no bears are coming around here. Make sure the dogs aren't excited. And what do you do after your patrol? Well, we got some uh, harvesting to do, and we got cabins to make if we can get to it. But our country is. Uh, a little hard on us with snow and gravel. <laughs> we can't use skidoos right now because too much gravel. We can't use bikes now because there's too much snow. Uh, either way, and water is getting too cold. <laughs> Ice starting to form. As we drove around, Peter showed us some local landmarks. They built that hockey rink here before with the raw family contributions to it because they were watching the kids skating down here when there were polar bears down there. Yeah. <laughs> Are you hunting today? Well, you know, we could, if we see a seal out here in open water, if it was close. You got your gun? I answered my own question when I looked down at my feet and realized that his hunting rifle was there and ready to go. He's a man ready for any situation. And up in the high Arctic, that's a skill you just have to have. As we pull over to take some pictures, Peter pulls up to an abandoned barge to make sure that there are no polar bears behind it. The polar bear population of Resolute is thriving. When we were there, at least 17 bears were lounging a few kilometers away at Allen Bay. Do you want to take a picture? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Wait, let me take a, uh, make sure there's no bears over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Mm, no one's hiding Gotta behind somewhere. Always check for these bears. Sometimes they're just right off the edge too. Eh? Oh, they're sneaky. Yeah, they could be. They also like the ice. Watch out for the bear tracks, you know. <laughs> yeah. Next, we make our way to a monument outside of town. The monument juts out of the flat tundra landscape. It's two large brown rocks with a gray carving of a man dressed in his traditional Inuit clothing. The monument 
unveiled in 2010 in Resolute Bay, depicts a solitary man looking out on the ocean. Two stone benches in front seem to invite you to sit and reflect. My father was asked to make that carving. Your father made this carving? Yeah, as a monument for the people from northern Quebec. It's facing, it's facing straight down Nunavik, northern Quebec, straight towards uh, Inupjuak, facing straight down. That's what they were looking, hoping for them to come. <laughs> and what's a, what is it representing? Uh, the people, us, we, we're here. <laughs> they said that it was an experimental program that the experiment bloomed. So we're here. <laughs> but there were tough times for people. Hey? There were tough times for people to make it here. Like, it wasn't easy on your parents. No, no. <laughs> when they brought them here, this time of the year, they had to pitch up a tent. They had to stay in a tent? Yeah, this cold all out. winter until we were up to get snow, they said. <laughs> where those piled rocks? This is where the Canadian Coast Guard dropped them off here, right in this area. And the Americans were saying, go into the bay and drop them off over there. Yeah. No, they, they put them here through the waves and all that. <laughs> we get out to take a closer look. There's a plaque on one of the stones that we consider. Can you read it to me? No, I can't because I don't have my Bible. Okay. They came to these desolate shores to pursue the government's promise of a more prosperous life. They endured and overcame great hardship and dedicated their lives to Canada's sovereignty in these lands and waters. Wow, you know. <laughs> in memory of Inuit landed here in 1953 and 55. I've heard younger people say they were Canadian flagpoles. Uh, that's what they were, that's what they started saying. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's where, what they were saying, I just picked it up from them, so I guess they were flight poles. Nancy, Peter's wife, works for the Hunters and Trappers organization, but she's at home on the day we meet her. We walked up to their little red house. Outside, there's a tanned polar bear hide flapping in the wind. I got a vicious dog in there. Vicious dog? Yeah. Okay. Hello, vicious dog. It's a small black dog, happily wagging its tail. <laughs> it's a something. So scary. As we come in, Peter speaks to his wife Hello. in a nook to toot. Hello, I don't know what they're saying to each other, but I imagine it involves explaining why two strangers are walking into her house holding cameras and audio recorders. Good morning. Hi, Nancy. My name is Danielle. I'm with APTN. Nancy, you Nice to meet you, Nancy. I asked if we could come over and just meet you and say hi. Welcome to our house. Thank you. She and Peter have been married for 34 years. I ask them what their secret is. Lots of forgiveness and lots talking together. Mm. Talking, mm. yeah, absolutely. We've been together 44 years. 44 years? Yeah. Wow. We were together 10 years before I asked him to marry me. You asked him? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> as soon as we came in, Peter and Nancy started showing Trevor and I some of their collection of rocks, tools, and other precious items. Some were from my great grandparents. Wow. From here too and in there. While we are talking, I ask Nancy, who has lived in Resolute Bay for most of her life, what changes to the climate she has seen. She moved with her parents when she was two. We don't have any more ice. Like, we got lots of glaciers, the yeah. yeah. icebergs now, but no ice. Wow. So we have to go to a river, so we have to carry water if we want to make tea or coffee. Yeah. I point to a photo collage on the wall and ask about it. There are brightly colored marine plants and animals. Ocean. Yeah. Wow. In our bay, most of them. A friend of ours is a scientist to a diver. He took those. See what's in our ocean. It's more than you would think. Yeah, a lot. Like a lot of stuff. Never knew there was that much animals down there. Yeah. Sea creatures until they showed us. Do you guys uh, expect to see more uh, ships, like shipping ships? A lot. There, there was about um, 14 and lots of little yachts. Besides the new traffic, a warming Arctic also has international implications for Canada and the small communities that are located in the north. As temperatures rise and the ice continues to melt, shipping routes between the Arctic could cut transit times by between 30 to 50 percent for major routes like those connecting China and Europe. In a document obtained through an access to information request, a military briefing for the Minister of National Defense says, with the receding sea ice, Arctic and non-Arctic states seek to advance their interests in the region. It is anticipated that the Department of National Defense will be called upon to support sovereignty functions. The same document states that the American view on the Northwest Passage maintains that it is a strait used for international navigation. I asked Nancy about a rumor I had heard around town about one of these navigational increases. I heard um, a billionaire guy came here this summer. Mm -hmm. I don't know who. Do you know who? Bill Gates. He yeah. had his own. He, he had a, that was a small one, yeah. He had his own private boat, a research boat. That was his own. All the other crew were all here, and that's how rich he was. Helicopters on both ships. Oh. That was Bill Gates, you think? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Wow. And uh, Blues Brothers, the actor. That act right. Yeah. Yeah, him. He was here with Bill Gates, too. Dan Aykroyd and Bill Gates. Yeah. You guys are regular celebrity sites here. Yeah. There are a lot of rich people with their own yachts. Whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they have their own servants and all. Ooh. I could live like that. I could live like that. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Slight tangent here. Before I could report on this, I had to try and figure out what I could about Dan Aykroyd and Bill Gates going on a cruise together in the Northwest Passage. I emailed the agent for Aykroyd and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for possible information, but no one got back to me, which isn't really a surprise. But it was intriguing. The idea that the melting of the summer ice meant that the uber-rich were showing up on the shores of a remote Inuit community. I asked Stephen Watkins, an Ottawa-based IT security consultant, who also enjoys tracking both ships and aircraft, you know, as a hobby. He gave me an in-depth briefing with the title, Resolute Bay's Notable Billionaire Yachts of Summer 2023. We were looking for two super yachts, and according to Nancy's description, they both had a helicopter and landing pads. Stefan, can you introduce yourself for me? Oh, I'm a uh, privately funded researcher who does independent research on um, ships and planes and uh, tries to inform the public and uh, journalists and explain to people how to do this sort of stuff through open source intelligence or open source intelligence methods. And uh, that's that's how I met you, was I had a, a really weird question for you about uh, if you could tell me if Bill Gates and Dan Aykroyd were floating around above the Arctic Circle. Definitely the most interesting question I've had lately. And um, 
I uh, I sort of I pursued that that angle, and you gave me a few names of ships that you you'd seen, and so I uh, I poked around at those, and um, then I used MarineTraffic.com for searching for ships, and um, MarineTraffic.com collects the AAS transmissions from the ships by having a globally dispersed group of um, a network of receivers. And uh, those receivers collect the data from the ship that the ships are transmitting uh, that will say its uh, speed, direction, location. So uh, near Resolute, there is a receiver. And uh, I started following what was going on there in the time period that we were looking for. And um, started with August because it seemed that if you're going to the Arctic, August would probably be the nicest time for the weather. So uh, to make that far a trip, I would think somebody would want to pick the best weather of the year. So uh, I was going to work backwards to May, I think was the earliest time that you thought that we should target. And um, I saw two ships uh, that were traveling together and uh, they got near resolute and they were popping into every inlet along the way. And neither of them were tied directly to Bill Gates, though. Synthesis is owned by a company called Fusion Holdings, and the other, the Nansen Explorer, specializes in polar exploration. The Nansen Explorer is available for rent for the low rate of just over $500,000 per week. So we know that someone with some pretty deep pockets was in Resolute on October 21st, 2023. Either way, Nancy was pretty relaxed about the whole thing. Well, they're here, so we always want to make them feel comfortable. Yeah. Welcome to Resolute Bay. Mm -hmm. Mention it to everybody. Yeah. 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 The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, also called the IPCC, lists one of the consequences of climate change for the polar regions will be greater constraints in the use of ice roads and open seas allowing for more vessels to pass through. This means increased shipping, more private ships, and increased risk of hazardous waste and oil spills. So what is the history of the Northwest Passage? It's a place that just a few hundred years ago seemed impassable. The Northwest Passage, once a perilous frontier, is now home to a new kind of exploration, a cultural exchange navigating through Inuit culture and the challenges of a changing world. In 1845, Sir John Franklin, a seasoned British explorer, set sail with two ships, the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror, in a quest to discover the fabled Northwest Passage. Tragically, the expedition met a grim fate as both ships became icebound. 129 people lost their lives, and the passage was not fully navigated by boat until 1906. The ships from the expedition were lost until 2014, when a search led by Parks Canada found the Erebus. Two years later, the terror was found in pristine condition by the Arctic Research Foundation. They found it right where an Inuk hunter said that they would. Here's an APTN story from 2016. Parks Canada and the Coast Guard have spent millions looking for Franklin's lost ships. But for more than a century, there have been Inuit stories of where the ships were located. But Canadian officials never bothered to look. Nearly two centuries after the Franklin expedition, the region is still a place for exploration. This summer, Mariah Erklu, an Inuk youth from Pond Inlet, finished her second expedition on a tourist voyage in the Northwest Passage. She worked as a cultural ambassador, sharing Inuit culture with those on board. I found a Facebook post about her travels in the Northwest Passage and asked if she'd share her experience. It was a first for a lot of things. Um, It was right after COVID, so we were the first ship to go through the Northwest Passage. And on top of that, we went in the middle of July, and that was considered the earliest that a ship um, attempted to go through the Northwest Passage. So there was like a lot of firsts happening. Um, The voyage was, um, it took about 21 days. 
We started in Greenland and we ended in Alaska. So we traveled through all Nunavut. I've only been to like a few places. And so when we were going through the Northwest Passage, it was like I've never been to these communities. It was like my first time. Mariah said that she takes the opportunity to speak to tourists to talk about the importance of the Inuit connection to the land and how she makes that connection. I think you've done a really good job of painting the visual picture of like going through the Northwest Passage, what the, what the landscape changes look like. But when you're there and you're sharing culture, what do you think is important for people to learn? What do you want to make sure that they know when you're on that ship? Okay, so like when I'm on the voyage, one of the first things that I usually mention is how I've I've known and understood the land, um, going out camping and hunting and and going out on the ice. Um, I know the land in Inup- in Inuktitut first, which is my language. And then I didn't learn the English names until much later, but I needed to learn them in order to present on them. And and just like the knowledge that we hold and even just the land place names, there is a lot of history there. Like if I say one word and Inuktitut to someone, they'll just recognize what that place is like. Because a lot of the land place names are it is what it resembles it is what it provides um what the area looks like and things like that virtually every community across the north is now struggling to cope with extreme coastal erosion thawing permafrost and rapid destructive runoff, which particularly affects coastal communities in Alaska and in northern and western Canada. Despite cold northern winters, sea ice remains in rapid decline. Glacial melt, long relied on for drinking water, is now unpredictable. In the next episode of The Place That Thaws, we talk to Devin Manick, a 22-year-old bringing back the tradition of dog sledding to Resolute Bay. I started off with one dog, and then a German Shepherd, and then another dog. Um, but that was like kind of the beginning. And then I got two Inuit sled dogs after that. And from there, I started from scratch, basically. And I raised them to adults and and then they bred and I just kept going from there. The show is written and recorded by me, Danielle Parody. Audio editing by Jesse Andrushko. Producer, Mark Blackburn. The title music is by Angela Amarulik. Her song is about the springtime. You can find her on all major streaming platforms. All of the sources for the show can be found in our show notes. You can email me, dparadis, P-A-R-A-D-I-S, at aptn.ca. If you like this podcast, please consider donating to support Indigenous news. Go to aptnnews.ca slash contribute. Hello, I'm Rick Harp, host of APTN News Brief, a daily podcast version of the nightly broadcast of APTN National News. Available on all major podcast platforms, APTN News Brief is your quick way to hear the headlines every weekday morning. Learn more at aptnnews.ca slash podcasts.